You know what we say? We're never too young to think about aging. Join us for this Zoom Catcher's special presentation, Conversations on Aging, the podcast. We'll be talking with industry experts on engaging issues. Whether it's science and technology, Medicare fraud, elder care, or justice, we got you covered. 2030 is quickly approaching. Will it be the golden years or the silver tsunami? Stay tuned and find out. We're all stakeholders. Let's learn and age together. Remember to subscribe to our Zoom Catchers YouTube channel and follow us on our socials. Welcome to this Zoom Catchers special presentation on aging. You know what we say, you're never too young to think about the importance of aging and the various issues that go along with that. So thank you so much for being here. I'm Kimberly Gunn, Executive Director of Zoom Catchers. And we have a special guest who is going to be telling us important information that we all know she's representing the California Commission on Aging. And that would be Lisa Coleman. She is the Legislative Director of the California Commission on Aging, long-term advocate of elder care issues, elders in our community, so many things that we're going to be learning today. I'm super excited to have her on the show. Welcome, welcome, Lisa. How are you doing today? I am excited to be here. Thank you. Great. We are super, super excited to have you. And please introduce yourself and tell us about what's going on with the California Commission on Aging. Sure, sure. So as you said, Lisa Coleman, and I'm the legislative director. I'm I'm relatively new to this position. I started in the spring with the commission. And and prior to that, I was the executive director for the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association. So a lot of my advocacy efforts have been focused on long-term care, whether that's assisted living or skilled nursing. But I was super excited for the opportunity to join the commission because the commission's playground is really very broad. It's not siloed into just long-term care facilities. It, it, their mission, the, the California Commission on Aging's mission, they are part of the California statute. They are in law, that they are the people's advocate, that they are to meet and speak with the governor, to legislators, to department heads, both state and federal, to, to talk about really all things that impact older adults and to a lesser extent, adults with disabilities. The commissioners are appointed by the governor or by leadership in the legislature. We currently have 19 different commissioners and their expertise is just very broad ranging. You know, we focus on housing, we focus on care, we focus on workforce, we focus on improving the the ability for the individuals and families that love them that, to, to have just the greatest quality of life as they see it. I mean, it, it's a pretty broad mission of advocating, celebrating Californians as we age. I thought it was funny when you were saying it's never too young to talk about aging because the moment you're born, you are aging. Mm-hmm. So we talk a lot about the services that people need, it's not so much about your chronological age, it's your physical condition. Because you, health is really what drives aging. You could be a very healthy and independent 90 year old, or you could be a 55 year old that needs a lot of services. It, It really is less about what the calendar says and more about your physical aspects of aging. Mm -hmm. But super excited to be here because my kids will tell you, this is my favorite topic. I love (laughs) talking about aging Mm -hmm. and not everybody is afforded the luxury to age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about this, excited to answer your questions. And thank you so much for being here and for participating in this conversation that I know is important to you. You are obviously passionate about it and it's important to to me and, and many, many people out there. And, you know, the driving force of, of this conversation and getting this going is I want to put a golden spotlight on my aunt Shirley and, and I'm a caregiver for her. And I know that, you know, my story as a, as a caregiver will resonate with a lot of caregivers out there. 
So my the first thing I want to do at the top of the show is acknowledge and honor all the caregivers that are out there helping keeping our elderly population alive and strong and, and hopefully thriving. And I want to thank you really for, for participating in this conversation and sharing your, your wealth of knowledge and all of the insight that you, you have gained. Do you want to just go over a a couple of interesting facts and figures so people are aware of just how many elders are out there. So it's estimated that by 2030, when the last of the boomer generation ages into older adulthood, it is projected that there will be 73.1 million older adults. So there is a a strong contingent, a powerful contingent of, of folks out there. And just a couple of other facts and figures out there. Older adults age 85 and up are the fastest growing age group in the country. There's more than 10,000 baby boomers that turn 65 years old every single day. There are also more than 55,000 seniors over age 100. And by 2050, the number of centenarians is expected to top 600,000, which is roughly the population of the state of Vermont. And then lastly, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, more than 56 million adults aged 65 and older live in the United States, will be accounting for 16.9% of the nation's population. So there, there is a lot for us to talk about. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Lisa. Tell us more about the California Commission's goals and vision, please. The commission, because, you know, it's advocating for older adults and and all of the aspects that impact older adults, they have a lot that they cover. But one of the things that we're really focused right now is in response to the California Master Plan for Aging. So I'd really like to spend a lot of time talking about that because I think that's really exciting. The Master Plan for Aging came about, Gavin Newsom acknowledged that California is aging, that what that's going to mean when we change from being a a population of largely of people that are in the working years, and instead we are converting over to more people over the age of 60 than under the age of 18. And so that, that's a big change in, in how workforce and services are delivered. And so the The governor wisely said we really need to start looking at how that magic number you said, 2030, when the oldest baby boomers turn 85. And and as you said, the year in which we historically utilize the most long-term care services and and at the greatest expense, very, very, very expensive. So the Master Plan for Aging, it took them a year. They had a wide group of technical experts and they narrowed it down to five broad ranging goals, housing for all ages and stages, health reimagined, inclusion and equity, not isolation, caregiving that works, and affording aging. So when we took those five broad categories, the commission identified three categories that they really wanted to focus on. And our first is improving behavioral health services for older adults. California, we have a desert of of behavioral health services. And why is that important? The data shows that even before COVID, 30% of older adults had a diagnosis of either depression, anxiety, or cognitive impairment. 30%. And that was before we had COVID that has... I would challenge any age demographic that has not been negatively impacted by COVID. We're seeing increased anxieties and depression and isolation, loneliness, fear, you know, prevalent in all of our aging, mm-hmm. but it's particularly impactful on older adults. And we don't have a lot of services for them. While I was saying that 30% of older adults have a diagnosis, less than 4% actually get services that address those conditions. Mm-hmm. So why does that matter? I mean, lots of old people are sad. Okay, why does that matter? Why it matters and why young people need to worry about it is because if you're sad and lonely and depressed, 
you probably won't be taking care of yourself. You won't be eating well. You won't be exercising well. You won't be taking your medications well. And if you're not doing those things, then your need for those services starts earlier. So it won't be when you're 85 and you need help. You'll need help at 80 or 75 mm -hmm. or 60. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's particularly telling that the state of California last year reduced the age to qualify for adult protective services from 65 down to 60. Wow. Because we're seeing a massive increase of younger olds that need support. Mm -hmm. So this behavioral health is, is just really critical and it's not going to be easy to fix. Mm -hmm. People have this kind of preconceived notion. Well, an older adult, they have Medicare and Medicare covers services and Medicare does cover services, but it's not designed to cover a lifetime of, of anxiety mm -hmm. or to overcome generational oppressions. We just, we're just not set for those kinds of services. And so the commission is very much focused on doing more to focus on what kinds of behavioral health services work for older adults. Mm -hmm. Do they do better in a, a group setting? Do they do better in one-on-one? -on -one? Do they respond faster to medication? Mm -hmm. How are we getting the services to them and what services do they want and need? And I want to point out an exciting program that I've recently come across is a peer support that's based in churches mm, where the Department of Public Health is giving some training to church members who then become peer supports for the other members of the congregation. You know, that's just like this natural relationship. You see right. them on a regular basis, you share life together. And now we're giving those in the congregation some skills to be able to provide some mental health services, behavioral health services. There's just some really cool best practices that, that are out there. And so the commission is working to help identify what those best practices are. I'm excited next week, we're going to San Diego and we're going to be looking at some really cool, innovative pilot programs that San Diego is doing for older adults with behavioral health. So that's one. Yeah. You know, behavioral health. And just like, you know, wanted to, you know, drill down on that issue a little bit more, just as far as the, you were saying that the peer training, what exactly does that look like? Is it just giving people you know, fact sheets? Is it, is the training, is it in person? Is it virtual? Is it a combination of all those things? Well, you, you're jumping ahead of me because <laughs> I haven't gotten to go to the trainings yet to really see for myself. I just get excited about seeing these things that come along. But to answer your question, my understanding, it's a little of all of that. Mm -hmm. It is, it's educating people in the community, people like you, of what services are available. And that kind of is what started this whole conversation. You were calling because you, you, you care for someone. And, uh, you know, I want to take a moment at this time to just thank you for that. Mm. Thank you for caring for someone else. I do, I do think when people ask me, you know, what, what would make things better? We just need to clone you guys that care. Mm. That's all. We just need to clone people that are willing to knock on their neighbor's door when they notice that the papers are piling up. We just need to be willing to slow down and not be anxious when the person in front of us at the grocery store seems to be having a lingering conversation with that checker. Maybe the only human interaction they have today or tomorrow. And just, you know, we could be, just be a little kinder, mm -hmm. caring for others, being more cognizant of, of the declines of others. I don't think our older adult population like to ask for help. I don't know that any population likes to ask for help, mm -hmm. but when our older folks don't get the services that they need in a timely fashion, they tend to fall apart. And then it's very expensive to bring them back together again. Because as I was saying earlier, you know, we can treat you for being depressed, but now we have to treat you for being malnourished mm -hmm. and that malnourished led to dehydration and the dehydration led to you losing your balance and the losing your balance led to you falling and breaking a hip. And so now we have to retrain you to walk. And all of this was because you were lonely mm -hmm. 
at the beginning. So that, um, yeah, and you know, and thank you for for acknowledging that because you know I know that there are are millions of, of people out there having to care for for loved ones or even family and friends and don't always get the acknowledgement that they need and certainly deserve. And, you know, we've talked offline about, you know, the, the, the whole idea of family planning. It goes beyond just having children and, and birthing people, but it's a, a, a lifelong process. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what you just spoke to, you know, got me thinking about, you know, what are some, some top things that, that families need to know to start to address the issue of, of aging in their families? How can families better operate as units so that we don't get to a malnourished elder person or something like that. If you could speak to that, that'd be great. I think part of it is we just have to destigmatize it and take some of this negativity to it. There's a lot of, oh, aging is hard. Aging is awful. Aging, you, nobody wants to age. That, I, I think it's kind of a funny thing. California sells more hair dye per capita than any state in the nation. Because as Californians, we just don't, we don't want to age. We don't believe in aging. And so if we're not willing to face that our hair is turning gray, we really aren't interested in having a conversation about how I might need some assistance with something as basic as trimming your toenails. Mm -hmm. You know, how many people end up in the emergency room having fallen because of toenails that have just grown long and they can't, they can't physically trim them anymore. Wow. And, and, you know, you just don't think about that. Mm. I mean, when was the last time you asked to see, hey, grandma, how are your feet? We just don't do that kind of thing. Mm. And we need to. We need to just normalize it mm-hmm. and have those conversations. When I think about my own family, I didn't know my mom had slipped into poverty. Mm-hmm. I just didn't. I grew up in a middle class home. She worked in a retail store. And she retired. And I just assumed that I I assumed Social Security covered it. I assumed she had a pension. I just made a lot of assumptions because my mother never shared anything. And it was my aunt who was on hospice and said, hey, you know, I need to let you know that I'm not going to be around to help support your mom and you're going to need to. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Come to find out that her Social Security didn't cover her rent. So she was going in the hole every month. And it wasn't on anything frivolous. I want to be really clear. My mother worked very hard and she was, she was a good steward of her money, but her money wasn't, wasn't keeping up with inflation. It wasn't keeping up with rent. It wasn't keeping up with the cost of food. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And because we grew up in this middle-class life, my mom didn't know what programs she could qualify for. She didn't know how to apply for programs. Mm -hmm. And so she just got quiet Mm -hmm. and, And I think that that's really incredibly typical. I won't say it's normal. I'll just say it's typical. And so my mission is now be bold, find out how is your family doing? How are your parents doing? How are your grandparents doing? How are your older aunts and uncles doing? Push the conversation. They may not like it because you may be touching on some nerves, but in the end, it's honest. And I think that's what family's about. Family's about looking at the good and the bad and the ugly and just saying, yep, here we are. This is what we've done. Yeah. And, and I think you, you know, you, you touched on something that, you know, I think is important to acknowledge, you know, in particular with our culture, kind of shy away from conversations around aging. Everybody wants to find that fountain of youth. And, you know, we all want, who doesn't want to not stay young, but there's a concept of young at heart. And, and the reality is we're living longer, we're living longer and we're being healthier and, and, you know, longer. And so, you know, I think it's important, as you said, for people to start to think about in your 20s and even 30s, you know, who's going to be there to take care of you? What type of golden years do you envision for yourself? Have you given that some thought before you end up in a situation where you're like, oh, my God, I have to take care of Aunt Sue and I'm not prepared and I have no idea what to do? It, as, as one of the, the cool things, kind of a side note that the master plan for aging has done is it's really brought in the disability community and, and how a lot of the services that adults with disabilities utilize are similar in some ways to services that older adults utilize. 
But the one thing I really wish my older adult colleagues, advocates, service providers would really take in the disability community as just a generalization is so much better at looking ahead. And I've never met a parent of a disabled five-year-old that wasn't already thinking about what services the child's going to need when they're 10, what services are they going to need when they're 15 and 20. And yet not a week goes by when I don't get a call from someone who's like, mom is 90 and she's, she's slipped. She's in the hospital. It's not a broken hip. It's a fracture. So she's not going to go into the nursing home. She's not going to have rehab, but we can't take her home because she's got seven stairs that she can't navigate. What do we do to the, tomorrow? Like, well, She's 90. Didn't you kind of think this was going to happen? Well, no, she was doing great. We just never assumed that mom would need any help ever. And so now she's in the hospital, going to be discharged in the next few hours, and the family has to make decisions and figure things out. And inevitably, when you are making decisions in a moment of an emergency, in a crisis, you're not making good ones. And so it it's more expensive. It's more traumatic. It is more dramatic. There's just a lot more emotions that are attached to it rather than just starting to have this pragmatic conversation. I would push back on one thing that you were saying about how older adults needing mm -hmm. older adults offer mm -hmm. older adults provide also. And I, I really want us to focus on that when we, when my husband and I, when we decided that it made more sense financially for us to find a home where my mother lived with us, we call this assisted living. Because I assist her, certainly, but she assists me. Mm -hmm. My mother is still a far better cook than I will ever be. <laughs> right. But, you know, the ability to, to stand long enough to shop for the food, to bring the food home, to prepare the food, and then clean up after the food is growing more challenging for her. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that behind that stove, she's not better at it than I am. Mm -hmm. So she does assist me. Mm -hmm. An older adult, they have they have the benefit of life. They have the benefit of understanding, you know, what, what really is a crisis versus what's an inconvenience? Mm -hmm. what, what is the, you know, everybody rally together, we've got to do the team, this is big. And what's just a blip on the radar that in a couple of weeks, we're really not going to be all that worried about. And that's, you know, you just, you don't get to be an older adult without having faced challenges. It just doesn't happen. You know, I've yet to meet someone who, oh, I came to know the Lord when I was five years old. I've walked with him every day of my life. I'm <laughs> now 95 years old. I'm going to be with my Savior and every day has been a glorious day. Mm -hmm. I've never met one of those people. Right. I hope right. to someday, but I have never met one of those people because life is full of ups and downs. And so I you. want us to really focus on that, that older adults give as much as they get. Mm -hmm. No, and, and thank you so much for, for highlighting that because you are so right. I mean, having s spent so much time with my aunt, listening to her, you know, all the presidents that she's gone through, she can, her long-term memory is still pretty sharp. And, and so we have great conversations about various points in her life, how those points interjected with big historical things. And I've, I've learned so much from her. And, and, and you're absolutely right. I think oftentimes what gets lost in the conversation is, oh, this person needs something. Oh my God, they need, they, they need this and they have to shuttle them there. But the reality is just like all of us, they have lived lives. They continue to live mm -hmm. lives. They continue to make contributions regardless of, of what may be going on as far as caregiving needs. And, and thank you for, for pointing that out. Yeah, and older adults can teach us a lot about fortitude. Uh, you know, if, if you asked a twenty-year-old, "Would you like to 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 wake up in pain?" What twenty-year-old wants to wake up in pain? But by the time you hit your seventies, that's kind of the norm, and we just put it into perspective. I love the surveys that talk about the happiest decades in most people's lives are in their 50s and 60s, that that's when they have the greatest amount of joy. And they are starting to have that, the issues are starting to creep in. Perfect. 
I wanted to just go back and, and talk about some of the resources, because I know that the commission is working on looking at, you know, long-term planning, but what would you say are some of the top resources that, let's say, a family might need to, to access to, you know, assist with someone in their golden years or, you know, someone who's in their 40s and 50s who wants to maybe plan ahead? Absolutely. So I, I think we started this conversation talking about it's really a matter of health and less a matter about what the calendar says as far as age. At, at any point, an adult could have an accident where they need long-term services. You know, accidents, illnesses, you know, if you, if you step off the curb wrong and you break both of your ankles, I challenge you to try and get yourself to the bathroom tomorrow. I know that those, that could happen at any time. So one of the things that I encourage everyone over the age of, of 19 is to fill out an advanced healthcare directive. Now, advanced healthcare directives can be very complex and they can go into great detail about what you want at the end of your life. And if you want harps and you want kittens and you want these people there or those people you don't want there. So advanced healthcare directives can be a very in-depth document. But I would suggest that every adult looks at the advanced healthcare directive from the perspective of who do I want to speak for me if there comes a time when I can't speak for myself? And, and that's a document that needs to be updated. I would say every time you get your driver's license renewed, every time you have to take the test again, advanced healthcare directive, update it. Because who could speak for you in your 20s may not be the same person who speaks for you in your 40s. And when we're looking at an advanced health directive and what services might you want at the end of your life or to prolong your life, that changes too. When you're in your 40s and 50s, you might want to have more aggressive treatments. When you're in your 70s and 80s, that might be less so. So an advanced healthcare directive is not something, it's not a one and done. It really is something that has to be updated regularly, but everyone needs to fill one of those out. To me, it's just the saddest thing when we, we talk about there's the hospital association says there's 10,000 people every day residing in long-term care facilities that cannot speak for themselves and they don't have anyone to speak for them. And so strangers have to make decisions on what's in their best interest. And, and that's just sad. And I think if we were to have this conversation about filling out the advanced healthcare directive, and when you fill one out, you have to tell the person that you're assigning them this duty. You have to ask them that. You can't just put down somebody's name and not tell them. That to me is, a, is completely unfair. If I'm gonna put your name down, I need to have a conversation with you about what do I want? What are my values? And that conversation will open the door to what is my expectation for later in life? Do I see myself wanting to live alone? Do I see myself wanting to live with family? Do I see myself wanting to live in a facility? I think that's another big part of this conversation is that we have to get a lot. We have to get away from all the blame and the shame, the blame and the shame that an older adult might need assistance with getting dressed, the blame and the shame of a person's disease process might lend itself that they live in a facility is how they get the best care possible. And that's, that's very loaded. I mean, I get that a lot. Well, you know, we would never put our mom in a home. Okay. So then the person who doesn't have all that extra support and has to find a placement for their mom, we should fill them with shame and guilt. I think that's really my, my message is it doesn't have to be so dramatic. It doesn't have to be so traumatic. We could just have some conversations. We could lighten up a little bit. Yeah, you're going to fall. Yeah. That happens. Maybe happens. instead of getting so embarrassed about it, you just spend a minute down on the ground and you admire the view before you jump right up and pretend like, oh, I didn't trip. You know, <laughs> when, when, you, when you just can't manage to do your toes anymore, could we make it a game? Could you maybe say, hey, granddaughter, could we go get a pedicure together? Could, could we could we just make it a bit more human? Could we could we maybe put the depends? Uh, could we give them a different name? Mm -hmm. I think this is funny. We have loves. We have huggies. We have pampers. 
And we have to. But when you get old, are we going to help you? That depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah, and you bring up a great point about you know the language, right? And and how we even talk about these things. And you know, I think just with my own experiences caring for my aunt, you know, I've had to make some mental adjust adjustments myself, you know, and because I, I know a lot of people will understand it. It can be challenging, right? You have great days, not so great days, you know, some days wondering, wow, is this okay? Here, here we are, you know, working through a challenge. And so I think it's important also to acknowledge those parts of it too. It's, it's not easy, right? And we all need need support and we all need to understand, you know, and you're right. I mean, in particular with, with the pedicure, when my, my aunt was still going out more, we, you know, we would go together. We'd get our pedicures t done together, you know, and so it was like a, a, girl's, a girl's day out and then we'd go have some lunch together. So there's definitely ways that we can reimagine and reframe those activities that we kind of take for granted. Oh, you, you want to clip? I can clip my toenails right right now, but at some point I probably won't be able to, right? Mm -hmm. And and to think, how do we usher through those those change? How do we usher in those changes and navigate those phases of our lives? Yes, with with grace on both sides. Mm -hmm. I do. I see a lot of baby boomers are really going to struggle with this. Mm -hmm. You know, baby boomers. Your, your younger audience members may not remember the joy of turning 15 and six months and one day because that was the day we got our driver's permit and we had freedom behind the wheel on our 16th birthday. And, you know, that was the baby boomers were the drivers and the independence. And to lose your keys is just this massive blow to, to their ego and to their sense of self-determination. And yet younger adults, oh, you know, hey, there, there's Uber, there's Lyft, there's, you know, I, there's a lot of, of, of different ways of getting around. And, and so I think our older adults have to also learn to be a bit more flexible, that some of the things that they thought were going to happen maybe aren't going to happen. And, and that's okay. Because again, I go back to older adults are, are pretty resilient. Yeah, they can be disappointed that the disease process didn't allow them to continue to clip their own nails, right? That, that's happened. Well, it is what it is. So you can hide it in shame and suffer, or you can just be a bit less proud and say, okay, this is what I need. And, and then as citizens helping to provide those services and to make sure that as voters, we're voting for programs that promote these services, because that's, that's a big part of this. When we're talking about the services, when you and I met, you were asking, well, what services are available for my aunt? And I, I was really um, disappointed to say, not much, mm -hmm. you know, this is predominantly a private pay industry. You, the middle class, the, it, as far as older adult services, is often referred to as the missing middle mm -hmm. because we have programs that are designed for the those that are on low income on Medi-Cal, and then we have services that are available through private pay. But if you're in the middle, if you make just a little bit too much for Medi-Cal, but you don't have a million dollars in the bank, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of services that are set up for those folks. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we as voters are going to have to be more thoughtful about that. We're going to have to look at that and how do we spend our money? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you know, you, you bring up this issue that I wanted to, you know, talk about, and that is you've been obviously involved in this field for, for quite a while. And thank you so much for your service and your advocacy. You know, what would you say are, what's on your wish list? Like if someone waved <laughs> if a genie popped out of a bottle and said i grant you three wishes like what would that be as far as this issue uh first is that we would do a massive marketing campaign people need to know what services are available no one saves for an eventuality they don't believe is going to happen so if you are under a belief that your Blue Cross or your Kaiser or your your health plan is going to provide you with in-home care. I, I just no, that's not an option. That doesn't happen. It, it, short term, sure, but long term, no. 
if you're under a belief that um, that you would always be uh, eligible for IHSS in-home supportive services. No, that's not true. And really, that to me is the biggest thing is that people, families need to know what services are available and how much services cost and what's the wait list for these services. Because I can tell you about certain programs, but some of those programs have wait lists that are so long, likely is that your aunt would die before she'd ever make it to the top of that list. So I would say a giant marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to know what's out there, what services are available, what they cost, who, how do you get them, where do you have to go for them? The other would be, I, I really want us to examine this whole notion of what is the pinnacle of success for aging. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I looked to my dad and he would say it is living alone in his home. But that, that's not really healthy. Mm -hmm. you know, a big house with three empty rooms with him by himself. That, is that really the pinnacle of success? Maybe multi-generational housing, maybe home sharing. Maybe we could look at a little less about all about me and maybe a little bit more about all about we. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be my, my biggest thing. Cause I think, I think we would all be a little bit happier. I, I think that um, our young children would really benefit from sitting on the lap of a great grandparent. Mm -hmm. And I think our great grandparents would really learn to be a lot more tolerant if they had to live, if they had to deal with a little bit of the noise. Mm -hmm. you no, know, we, we, we kind of like this, well, I'm going to move behind a gated community. I don't want to be around those kids. They're really loud. And, you know, I'm going to, I don't, I want to go to those restaurants because they have a lot of kids and I want it to be quiet. And I want it to be all controlled. And I'd say, yeah, life's pretty nice. <laughs> Off my lawn. <laughs> well, that, that would be my genie. And so then could we start building houses that promote intergenerational? I can tell you, it took us months to find a house that would work that had my mom's area. And you know, so we have, a, we were very fortunate. We found a house that has a bedroom and a bathroom and a garden area on one side, and then three bedrooms on another side of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, but trying to find one that's in a moderate priced income, boy, that's a challenge. And so I think we really do have to be looking at high, higher density housing and how we can have more intergenerational family housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd love to see, you know, like foster parenting for grandparent fostering. Mm -hmm. you no, know, we have, we have adults that, that, uh, they've had an injury or an illness and they need a little bit more time. They need a little bit more support. Well, maybe they could move in with a family similar to how we have foster children. So we are having, you know, supportive housing this way. Mm -hmm. We could look at tax benefits. Um, currently, if you have an older adult that's living you, that's, you don't get to claim them as a dependent the same way you would a child under the age of 18. And yet, if you're providing, you know, housing and food and shelter, maybe, maybe we should be looking at those kinds of things. One of the things that the commission is looking at is under the codes for assisted living facilities, uh, the small homes that they're tucked into everybody's neighborhood. It's a, it's a house that can provide six, up to six residents care in a home. Well, how come it's just six? Other states, it's, it's more, other states, it's less. We just picked six in California um, and we never moved, even though, six, you know. an even that, number, right? <laughs> well, it really, I, I I can't prove it, but this is what my gut says. Mm -hmm. The licensing has always said that you can't have more than two people in a bedroom. So, okay. So we have two, two adults sharing a bedroom is the most you could do. Mm -hmm. And when this was created in the mid eighties, the average number of bedrooms in a home in California was three. So two times three, you get six. We've divided <laughs> there six it is. Four. Fifth, fifth grade but, math. <laughs> there you go. But somewhere in the nineties, the average number of bedrooms in California popped up to 3.5. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot more houses that had four and five bedrooms, but we didn't allow them to do eight or 10. We could. Interesting. Yeah. We had to change the law. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of things we could just kind of get out of the way and, and, and make things just a little bit easier for folks. If, if we just started thinking that way. And I think that there is a drive for that. I think, 
when we see the big switch in November at the Capitol, there's going to be a lot more legislators that come from you know, split families, mm -hmm. a lot more legislators that have had to care for aunts and, and grandparents and parents. So they're going to be more sensitive to that. A lot more legislators that have had to just balance a bit more family and work life mm -hmm. than maybe previous generations of legislators. So I think that we're going to see more focus mm -hmm. on making aging uh, more accessible in, in just broadly in legislation. Well, well, that would be awesome because, you know, part of a big part of the driving force of this conversation was just my own pers personal user experience, you know, having to na navigate, we'll, we'll call it that, navigate the whole system. And, you know, there were just many times when I, I thought, wow, this is a nightmare where I'm literally spending hours on the phone on calling this group and then this agency. And it just felt like the different parts weren't necessarily working together, mm -hmm. you know, and having the conversation that we initially had was, was great. It was like, oh my God, one person who can like one stop shopping. I was able to get a lot of things understood just in that one conversation. And that I think is something I would just love to see just from a, a, a personal user experience. It's just a comprehensive mm -hmm place where you can go and like, here it is, here are the issues you need to understand. Here are some of the roadblocks. And there are quite a number, I might add, that kind of get put in your place. And, you know, my advice to people is don't take no for an answer. <laughs> like, Keep going, keep calling and keep pursuing because we're all dealing with this, right? If you, you're a person, you're aging, you personally will be experiencing this. You're, you're going to have family and friends. So it, it, I think it's, the timing of this conversation is great. And I really, really appreciate you, you know, coming on and imparting your, your wisdom and your knowledge. It's, it's fantastic. And then hopefully more people will, you know, derive the, the benefits of the conversation. We'll, and we'll start to have these conversations with their families. Hey, what do we need to do? We need to think about it because I tell you, it may sneak up on you in ways that you're not prepared and, and didn't expect. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you you are uh, you're kind of singing the the master plan for aging song right there, <laughs> because the whole theme is no wrong door. It is all about one stop. I remember telling you about the ADRCs, the ADRCs, and and we're going to see those uh, those center resources that are going to be pop just popping up all across the state because people are just like you, and that that you need multiple services and it. It is very difficult if you have to fill out multiple different applications and it's just the same person. Um, so, so the state is hearing that and they're moving towards that one-stop shop. And I think that that's, that's absolutely right on. Um, and, and I guess I wanted, to, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time about the dark side of this, about well, why do we have to care? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a report, it was published in the LA Times in March that the largest segment of the homeless population in California, the fastest growing segment are those over 55. Mm -hmm. Homeless for the first time at 55. And I want people just to take a moment to think about what that means. That's that aunt, that's your grandmother, it's your mom or dad. And how, how much more difficult it is to house a person after they have now gone on a, spending time on the streets. Uh, you know, what I was telling you before about the cut toenails that ultimately led to the broken hip and how, how this step, well, now we're adding homelessness to it and all of their possessions are gone. And so now it's, it's, it's absolutely starting, not just from scratch, it's starting from negative numbers. And we have to, we have to address this um, older adults and homelessness issue. It is, it's just conscionable. I, I, I have a struggle with that word. So the LA Times, the fastest growing demographic of people experiencing homelessness for the first time are those over 55. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I th and I think people should, you know, let that sink in. And, you know, it moves us into a part of the conversation that, that I wanted to talk about, too. And that is, you know, elder care fraud and abuse. I think, you know, based on my experiences, the impressions that I get is, you know, we there. it's a vulnerable population, right? It's a population, I can't imagine some people trying to navigate this on their own. It, it's not going to happen, right?
And I'm just going to put up some information just about fraud. You know, Medicare fraud is obviously a problem. But California's elders can fall prey to fraud and abuse in a number of ways. You know, one of them is doctors and providers ordering unnecessarily lab tests and procedures. Also, medical supply companies billing for equipment and products that are neither ordered nor delivered. And also nursing homes allowing patients to suffer from bed sores, malnutrition and dehydration because of staffing issues. So there's definitely those types of issues going on. Also, services not being rendered, you know, properly. So my experience is it's something that you really have to be on top of and you have to do your homework and you have to understand what the expectations are, what people should be providing, and also know, you know, patient care, patient rights, those things. Don't assume that people are uh, giving you all the information that you need to know, I guess is, is my point. You need to dig a lot deeper. Don't take no for an answer and keep going, right? Because... I hope that someone's there for me if I need an advocate and I'm not able to go to bat for myself. So I don't know if you wanted to speak to any of those issues. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, elder abuse happens in silence. It's because we're not, we're not having the conversations. So if, if I get taken advantage of because I click on the wrong link, you know, if I open myself up to malware and get hostage or whatever, uh, that that's that's a terrible thing if it happens to my mother i think there's this tendency of well maybe we should cut her off from her finances you know so so my mother's going to be less likely to share that this has happened because she's going to fear what are we going to think about her and are we going to think that she is you know incapable as no one's going to say that about me they're just going to say oh, you made a mistake you shouldn't have done that and so i think this goes to that conversation we were talking about earlier. We just have to have more conversations. We have to take away the shame of needing support. Everybody needs help. It just stop, stop blame gaming it. Stop shaming it. Being aware of what services are available to you. How much services cost. Those, those Medicare frauds are huge. And the cost to the system is so significant. Um, and some of it's really quite dramatic. I mean, mm -hmm. there's there was a case not too long ago of groups of older adults were given bus tickets to go across town. We're going to give you breakfast. We're going to give you have a box lunch. We're going to give you four, 50 bucks and you're going to go and we're going to have this medical examination mm -hmm. and then uh, send you home. And, oh, I got two meals and, and I got 50 bucks out of it. But then fast forward five years from now, when you need um, a wheelchair, well, you don't get one because you already had one. Mm -hmm. No, I never had one. Oh yeah, remember back when they took you on that bus trip, they ordered you a wheelchair and a walker and they ordered you know all this medical equipment that you never got, mm -hmm. but it's on your record. And so now you're not eligible for it when you need it. So that's, that's where we just, we just need to be sharing information. We need to be having our family included. We need to be looking at these things and finding out what services are available and what services you need and what services you don't need. There is no such thing as a free lunch. There never has been, there never will be. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, so yes, fraud is definitely something that we have to face. And the other part is care is expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get a lot of people that are like, well, how could it possibly be that much? You know, the average 24 hour in-home care will run you about $30,000 a month because it's three shifts of people and you know, it's expensive. And even if you only had one shift a day, even if you only had, you know, let's say you only had four hours of care at $25 an hour, that's three grand at the end of the month. It's expensive yeah. and, and we just don't think about things like that. And so those are the kinds of conversations people should be having. Of what can I realistically afford? What should I be saving for? And how does this work within my family? Mm -hmm. and, and also just from my own personal experiences, and I don't know if you want to speak to this as well. You know, there appears to be a home health aid kind of crisis. There's not enough of them mm -hmm. or, and I think it's gotten worse since the pandemic. I imagine it's issues around, you know, low pay. It's 
difficult work. It's hard taking care of a relative, and it's definitely harder taking care of a stranger or someone you don't know. So I don't know if you wanted to address the issues. That absolutely is an issue. It is about pay, certainly. Mm -hmm. It's a very low paying job historically. The programs through home health, home aid, uh, those are often, I mean, well, they are, if they are not minimum wage, they're very close, many of them. And in some areas of the state, those workers that their wages don't go towards Social Security. So they get done with providing care for a family member, and now they are close to retirement age, and but they don't have 40 credits. Because wow, really? Yeah. Uh, we rather than having the money taken out towards Social Security, they get to have that as a part of their paycheck. But then that means them not putting forward to their own benefits. And so we're just creating generational poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, so being aware of that. Then also, it is hard work. You know, before the pandemic, the big conversation was about loneliness and the, the detriment of isolation to the human body. And there was some study that talked about um, being alone every day was more detrimental to your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. Wow. And then we have the pandemic and we are encouraging people to be alone. Mm -hmm. So now you're an in-home care provider. You are in a home all day with an older adult that may or may not still be communicating. Mm -hmm. So talk about being lonely and isolating and feeling alone as a caregiver that it is, it's never acceptable to harm a, another human being, whether that's a child, an adult, an older adult, never, it's never acceptable. But I can tell you that no one woke up today and said, today's the day I'm going to slap my mother. Mm -hmm. It is the unacceptable becomes acceptable by degrees. We get more and more frustrated and we feel more panicked because we don't see a way out. And so that's where we really have to be pushing into having these conversations so that I would just say that if a family member that you know is providing care to someone, if they if they share with you that it's it's starting to get hard, that is the biggest 911 because if they're finally getting to the point where they're sharing that it's getting hard, it's probably been hard for months. And that that is a very quiet cry for help. And, and family members need to hear it with a bullhorn is that's how the unimaginable happens. Mm -hmm. That's where family caregivers do harm to people that they love because they are they are themselves broken and we're not doing a good job of caring for the caregivers. And what would you, and to, you know, to speak to that, what would you recommend people do? Are there um, resources out there? Are there hotlines, anything that you would recommend for, for caregivers out there? Just, just as you have new moms that get overwhelmed with the very physical demands of taking care of a child and, uh, you know, infants and toddlers, we need to be going to um, play groups, care groups, care support teams. We need to be investing in respite and getting a break, a change of pace. We need to be looking at, are there day programs that we could be participating in, the older adult could participate in so that the caregiver gets a break? Can we be looking at congregate living so that we are having four or five older adults that are coming together so that family members get a break? All of, this, all of the tools that moms had in place when their kids were younger and they were overwhelmed are the same kinds of tools that we can use when we're caring for older adults. We need to have close friends that we confide in. We need to have people that will come give us a break. We need to have open conversations about how hard it is physically and emotional, emotionally. The caregiving for older adults is really hard because no matter how great the care is, no matter if you do every single thing right every single day, 100% of them die. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality of this. Mm -hmm. and, and that is hard. It is just hard. It is hard on people's emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
It's not a surprise to me that we have caregivers that have left this industry. The first two years of COVID, California had 90,000 people die. 70,000 of that 90 were over the age of 65. Wow. wow. And 10,000 of those lived in skilled nursing facilities. Wow. There's only 100,000 beds. Mm -hmm. 10,000 out of 100,000, one in 10 died. And those caregivers felt that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a surprise to me that if I get paid the same to work at Target as I do to provide end of life care, I might go with Target. Yeah, it, it, it's hard work. It's, um, you know, difficult to be with someone and you know what the end of the story is, is going to be, you know. Mm -hmm. And if caregivers don't feel supported in society in general, it's like, well, why would I do this, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it feels to me that there just needs to be more appreciation and more understanding about caregiving in general. It's one of the backbone of our society, looking after each other. And hopefully, you know, spotlight can be put on them. So because there's going to be more people that are going to be in need of care. I mean, it's just reality, right? It's not going to be less. <laughs> no, no. But it, I, I mean, it sounds very doom and gloom, but I also want to point out, it is an honor. It is absolutely a sacred honor to care for someone at the end of their life. Mm -hmm. It is truly, you are entering into a sacred place, mm -hmm. but it is very hard. And the wages are historically very low. And it does tend to fall on our women of color, mm -hmm. um, women that don't have as much education. Mm -hmm. And so society has to address that. Mm -hmm. You know, people talk about, well, you know, we don't have enough people that are willing to do this because it's really, really hard work. And I would say of all the jobs that I've ever considered, the hardest job I've ever considered would be being a prison guard. I think that would be emotionally the, just the most soul sucking job. The hardest job I could imagine is being a prison guard. And yet in California, when we have an opening for a prison guard, we have plenty of people that apply for that job because there's financial compensation that makes up for the fact that, that is a hard job. We don't do that at the other end. Um, and, and so we just, we have to value it. We have to put our money where our, our our mouth is. We, we say that caring for children is important and we need to, to pay educators more. Mm -hmm. Well, caring for people at the end of their life is important and we just need to find a way to pay for that too. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the, the further that idea, people should think about what type of care do you want when you're at that age? Think about it now, you know, and, mm -hmm. and if we don't do something to address it now, you may be on the end of wishing, oh my God, I wish we had better care, right? Now is the time to really think about it and address it. What can we do? Higher pay, acknowledging people, acknowledging, you know, the value that it brings to people's lives. I know that there've been many times when I help my aunt with her oxygen and, and I leave that situation, you know, put on her oxygen or get it settled in her nose. And, and I walk away saying, you know what? I helped someone breathe today, right? Like <laughs> actually, may seem like a small thing putting in a tube helping someone but actually i help someone live a, a day with some, some some oxygen and break it down into those those steps i help someone get some nourishment today right and it definitely can help make get through a difficult day you know where it was just hard or where everyone's tired but to break it down into i'm helping someone sustain their life and there's value in that so Absolutely. So all you caregivers out there, we support you. We see you. We, we thank you. And uh, we're getting to the, the bottom of this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. I have, every time I talk to you, I learn something more. And you have um, definitely brought so much wisdom and knowledge to the conversation. I know it will re resonate with a lot of people out there. Before we head out, though, what would you say you want people to really, really, you know, take away from this conversation? What if they listen to this? What's the next thing that they need to do after they end this after they watch this? What What would you say the big takeaways are? I would say to do some self-reflection on how do you view aging? Uh, do you, are you are you ageist? 
do you see an older adult and just see the fragileness and the fragility of physical health? Or do you see a person who's overcome and has great internal resources? Um, so we really do need to look at ageism and think in terms of, are we committing ageism against people? So there's one is the self-reflection. If the answer is, you know, well, I don't want to age what I don't want to age, you know, I don't want to ever get old. I think that's probably a, a red flag. We got to, we got to look at that. Well, why wouldn't you want to grow older? What, what is inherently bad about it in comparison to what is inherently good about it? And I've got to push hard for intergenerational housing and, and intergenerational doesn't mean that you have to move in with your parents or your parents move in with you. It means that some older adult is living with some younger family. Family of choice does not have to be family of, of, you know, nuclear or birth or however that is. But I do think intergenerational housing is going to be a big key as we're moving forward. Um, that, you know, and, and intergenerational could be um, older adult day programs and children programs. So there's just, we just have to be creative. So I'm going to say, be creative. Think positively about growing older and take a moment when you know to think about the people in your life that may have quiet needs and start a conversation great thank you so much and then before we head out my last issue that i wanted to talk about because i know it'll be on people's minds what role do you see technology playing in the aging process absolutely yes caregiving is always going to be a high touch industry. You, know, you can you can automate making a car, but I don't know that you can automate rubbing a person's back and just being there when when they hurt. So it's always going to be a high touch, but there is technology that can that we can be using, especially in the areas of medication distribution. A, a lot of older adults um they can get a bit forgetful about taking their medications. And so there's some very cool tools that they can use that you preload and it has alarms that'll go off and say, you know, it's, it's time to take your noon meds and open the ice chest. And here's the, the juice box and the crackers that go with it. If it's medication that has to be taken with food. So there's technology that way. There's very cool technology for kind of home safing your home as far as cameras. That becomes a bit more challenging about the invasion of privacy, but just as you can set monitors on your windows, you know, if someone goes in, in through a window, you can set a monitors, you can set uh, space detectors. The older adult has gone into the bathroom and it's now been two hours and they haven't come out. And um, so someone can be notified. So there's technology, but again, you have to be very careful. I would never advocate for any kind of invasion of a person's privacy without their full and complete consent that you from my perspective just because you have grown old or frail or your voice is quiet does not mean that uh, your voice isn't important and that we ought that we we should somehow forget that you have self-determination that everything should be in your best interest it should be based on your expressed wish because I, that's how I live my life. I don't, I, I don't live my life in my best interest. I mean, if I did, I would exercise more and I'd drink less and I'd have less, you know, I had more money in my savings account, <laughs> but, but I, I get to go and buy those shoes because I want those shoes or, you know, I, I'm going to go and have pizza tonight because it's Friday night and I want to have pizza. So I get to live my life as expressed wish. So I'm very careful that we honor expressed wish for our older adults and not get so paternalistic about, well, you know, it, they have COPD, they shouldn't smoke. Mm -hmm. You know, they're 85 years old. If they want to smoke a cigarette, <laughs> who am I to say they shouldn't be able to smoke a cigarette? Right. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be stupid about it. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to say, you know, the person has advanced dementia and they want to go drive a car, give them the keys. But I am saying that maybe, maybe we find a way to allow that person to enjoy being in a car. You know, figure something out. So honoring a person's self-expressed wish and technology can help us with that. 
certainly zooming, just maintaining that connection, uh, fighting against isolation. Uh, technology has gotten much better about that. Um, you know, there are phones that you, you don't have to know the 10 digit code anymore. You just have to push one button and you can reach your granddaughter mm -hmm. uh, or your, your niece. So, so there's technology that way. There's going to be more technology coming down the, the road. I mean, just in other countries, they are a bit more proactive in health things. Like in Japan, they put sensors in the older adults' shoes when they start to complain about having some gait issues so that if there is a significant change in gait, the doctor's notified or there's charts that are indicating that. Whereas here, we wait until you've fallen and broken a hip, and then we come to realize, oh yeah, you were having some you know, mobility issues. So there are technologies, smartwatches. Are you an AFib? You know, are you having a heart, heart issue? Have you fallen? Mm -hmm. that, that was a great article that was in the paper about how smartphones are getting confused by roller coasters because oh, wow. uh, they're, yeah, the, the, smart, the smartphone thinks the person has fallen off of the cliff because the roller coasters dropped them 50 feet. No, I'm just uh, at Disneyland. So, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, there's that, but that's, that's a very cool device, right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up. It's not really a joke anymore. Right. Um, so what are some technologies that we can use so that families can be notified? You know, signing up for alerts, mm -hmm. uh, things like power outages, you know, that's pretty common now where the utilities are having to shut the power because it's a windy day. Okay. Well, is the, is the older adult in that residence, are they on this system? Mm -hmm. Are they being notified? Do they read their emails? Do they get text messages? Maybe rather than having that information just reside with the resident, maybe it should be forwarded to their caregiver. Maybe mm -hmm. their kids need to know that their power has been off for 12 hours because mm -hmm. they're oxygen dependent. Right. Or, you know, so, so using your technology and, and getting hooked up in alerts. Techn technology also to protect our finances. Mm -hmm. I help my mother, not because she can't do her own bills, but because everybody needs a little bit of a backup because sometimes things are confusing. And so it's just, it's nice to have these things set in place so that there's an ability for me to help her if she needs it. So using your resources, technology for you know, finances, it's a great way to help protect you from fraud. If you have systems in place so that you can't actually sign a contract for a whole new roof that maybe you didn't need. Right. Right. Great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you you being on our show representing the California Commission on Aging. And I'm just going to put up the commission's website. If you want to find out more about the commission, definitely go to their website. And hopefully this conversation will spark other conversations down the line. And we will continue to explore the topic because it impacts all of us. And like I say, you're never too young to think about aging. Thank you so much, Ms. Coleman, for being a part of our show. I really, really appreciate it. And we hope to see more about what the commission will be doing. Anything going on for 2023? Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. So focus the behavioral health addressing homelessness and housing insecurity, also workforce development. Uh, I think what makes the commission unique on our workforce development, it, everyone is, is recognizing that we need more workers to provide services for older adults. But the commission likes to point out that older adults can be looking for second and third careers. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say that your golden years are worth gold to the state of California. <laughs> And uh, this, this whole Zooming thing, we've learned that you don't have to go inside of a brick and mortar, you know, that you don't have to go into a building to be a productive worker mm -hmm. and looking at how people can contribute from home, you know, second and third careers and what that looks like that you, you pointed out, we, we are aging or we are, we are living longer. And so that system of retirement at 64 and spend another 30 years may not 
we may not be financially able to do that for a, for a growing number of us. So we may be needing to look at second and third careers. And so what are some technologies that we can use that can support older adults uh, transitioning? Now, you might not be able to do that job for 60 years. You may not want to do that job for 60 right. years. So maybe we can transition to something else and look to how we can promote that. How And so we are looking at actual some legislation mm -hmm. of how we could use retired annuitants differently because, well, it, it, as I said, your golden years are worth gold to the state of California. Love it. Love it. And hopefully we'll have you back on so we can hear about the the updates to what's going on, how the master plan continues to to play itself out. But thank you once again for for being here. We covered a lot of ground from home health aids, long term care, Medicare fraud, the future, the master plan. And just by hitting those topics, we all can see that we're all stakeholders everybody. So find your position, get educated, stay informed, visit the commission's website. Thank you so much for joining us for this special conversation on aging. Feel free to reach out to Ms. Coleman if you have any questions. She's a great resource. And check out the master plan and we will see you next time.